Good morning, all y'all. Doing better, huh? First time I came here, I think 10 years ago, I was really struggling with y'all. So I feel, I feel good. I've been a Texan for the last six years and refugee from California. I want to thank Pastor Don for inviting me again. And I love this man. Uh, he's a humble, mighty man of God. That's a rare thing today. Great combination. And I've been complimenting him over and over again that he smells like sheep. He is a real shepherd. And as Pastor said, uh, we were thinking and planning this visit before this war started a month ago. And also, interestingly enough, you've been studying Romans and Romans 11 this whole month. And I can't find a better chapter that talks about Jewish-Gentile relationship. So timing is good. The war is not good, but timing is good. Um, you know, it's a terrible thing that happened October 7th in Israel. Uh, for those, has anybody who have, did not hear me speak before, raise your hand. Okay, that's quite a few. All right. Um, originally from Israel, I grew up there. I served in the Israeli military. And 42 years ago, I had a divine encounter with Jesus Christ in Philadelphia from all places. I'm, I'm one of the very few fortunate Israelis that met his Jewish Messiah. Um, and surprisingly enough, I didn't know he was Jewish at the time. Um, you know, the Jesus that Jewish people have grown to know the last 2,000 years is not the love in Jesus you guys worship. So I'm very fortunate <clears throat> to have known him and have this love story going on for 42 years. Amen. And um, Israelis today as a nation pretty much are suffering from PTSD as a whole. This has been an event that has never happened before. And like Pastor said, in war there's really no winners. Uh, and the innocent always get caught in the crossfire. And I equally feel sorry for all innocent people. But the Jewish people also, have you seen on the news all the hatred that's spreading all over the world right now, the demonstrations? It's a very sad reminder of the days before the Holocaust when exterminating the Jews was a good thing. And they feel very much alone and hated as a people. And you know, they are the chosen people, but like fiddle on the roof is a line that says, God, can you choose somebody else sometimes? <laughs> it has been exactly a joy ride being the chosen people. And by the time I'm done today, I hope that I'll evoke a new level of compassion and love towards them in your hearts. Because that's what God wants. Uh, you know, there's really no explanation for this hatred, consistent hatred towards the Jews throughout history. You know, it's not the color of their skin, it's not land, it's not riches. But yet, there's not a group that's been consistently hated since the day God chose them. So it has to be spiritual, right? And how does God feel about them? Does he love them? Yes. Let's look at for a moment at Zechariah 2.8. If you can have it up there, Zechariah 2.8. 
I know I told them I'm not going to show scriptures, but I will show this one if we can. Anyway, until it shows up, it show up? not yet. He talks about the nations who are plundering Israel, but he calls them the apple of my eye. Apple is a very sensitive place. You ever touch to poke somebody's eye? If you don't, God doesn't like it when people plunder Israel. He also, in, Je- in Jeremiah 31, he says he loves them with everlasting love. Everlasting. Um, that's Zechariah. And let's see for a minute Jeremiah 31, 3. And he draws, he wants to draw them to himself. But I'm going to point out today that the tool he wants to use is you, you guys. You know, Romans 11, you've been teaching them to provoke them to jealousy. How you aim, fix to do it if you don't meet them? So we're going to try to arrange that meeting today. Um, You know, like I said earlier, for 2,000 years, what so-called the church had been a very scary thing for Jewish people. The name Jesus mentioned persecution and hatred. And in Israel today, there's about 9 million Jewish people that live there. Among them, there's about 6, 7 million who are native-born Hebrew-speaking, not immigrants. I'm the first generation after the Holocaust that grew up in Israel. My mom survived Auschwitz. So, um, and since then, there have been quite a few generations. So the majority of Israeli people are native-born Hebrew-speaking. And 99.9% of them have never, ever met a born-again Christian in their lifetime. They don't even know you guys exist. People are going, how many of you here have been on a regular tour to Israel? Raise your hand. Okay. On that tour, regular tour, how many real Israelis did you meet besides the tour guide? Not many, if any. Correct? So the flip side is, the average Israeli never meets a real Christian. And especially my hometown is called Naharia. It's the last town on the coast of the Mediterranean before Lebanon. It's off the beaten path of the tourists. So definitely they don't meet people. And <clears throat> as a result, it's an unreached group, people group for the gospel. Most people don't know that. People like myself, the honest estimate today that there's less than 3,000 of us in all of Israel. And we're minutes before the Lord's return. I mean, it's coming fast. It's accelerating towards us. Whatever happens in Israel is going to have ripple effects all over the world. You know, it's God's barometer in a sense. And, you know, it grieves me, you know, when um, I think about the reality of how few know him and what's still coming to Israel. This war right now is just the beginning. They're not going to run out of wars in Israel until the Lord comes back. And the next ones, Gog and Magog and Armageddon, will be very devastating. In the very end, only one-third of Israel will survive. Um, <clears throat> but the amazing thing that I've discovered, and how many here have been on a tour of duty with us to Israel to work on bomb shelters? Raise your hand. Okay. Probably most of them will be in the second service. Um, you probably will confirm what I'm about to share. I'm excellent in provoking the Israelis to anger. I'll repeat that again. 
I'm good at it. I have the personality like them, a big mouth like them, and I speak the truth, no compromise. But what I've discovered is that God built in the Jewish people, and Israelis particularly, a dormant responder. Have you ever seen this Natural Geographic series where in the desert there's no rain for many years and suddenly the rain comes and suddenly the whole desert is blooming overnight. Have you seen those? To me, that's the heart of the Israeli people. And you are the rain. Okay? That dormant responder cannot be awakened unless they see for themselves the real love of Jesus in his people. And when they see that it's real, it's genuine, especially when you show up to fix up the bomb shelter, that responder comes to life and never goes to sleep again. And so it's a unique role that you have that I don't, I don't, I can't do it without you. Like I said, I just arranged a meeting. And this vehicle of the bombshells that we'll talk about shortly has given to me by the Lord after 2006, after the war with the Hezbollah then, as a vehicle to smuggle you guys in and love on the people for a week. And it's nothing short of miraculous. I'm hearing reports right now under the current situation. How many are still feeling the love of God that came to the building, you know? And and I look at this as, as an historical opportunity, okay? You know, God did not choose the Jewish people because they're so smart, good-looking. Look at me. I miss the line when it comes to making money in business. I don't know what happened to me. I just, you know, I just work with my hands like a carpenter, a contractor. Um, but God is sovereign. He does what he wants. And he chose them. For better or worse, he chose them. There's not a group like that on the planet. And that's exactly why the devil hates them so much. They brought forth the Bible. They brought forth the Messiah. He's coming back to Jerusalem, not Corpus Christi. <laughs> what? <laughs> Watchale. Watchale or ichole. But... I describe the days we're living in as exciting and scary. That would be an accurate description, right? But, <clears throat> but I'd rather focus on the exciting. You know, the thicker the darkness, the brighter the light shines, in contrast. You see, after this war is over, which it will be over, and we will be victorious, it will be such a ripe mission field in Israel. They're looking for hope. And they have been looking in all the wrong places in the past. But so we want to change that. You know, we've been planning a trip, we call it a tour of duty, to go and remodel a bomb shelter in Israel for this last for this fall this fall. And then we got postponed to the spring. We had a date picked out. And now we'll see. But if Still war and still unsafe, we'll postpone it to the, to the fall. But as long as the window of opportunity is open, let's go. For a time like this, we're brought into this kingdom. Okay? You know, I won't take a team if there's a whole full-blown war. But, you know, it's dangerous just being an on-fire Christian. I don't care where you're at. The enemy wants to take you out. So it doesn't matter where you are, <laughs> right? So how many here, theoretically, would like to join me 
on a trip to Israel to work on a bombshell and bless the people then. Raise your hand. Awesome. After the service, there's a table out there with a sign-up sheet. Even if you signed up before when I was here, spoke on a Wednesday night service, sign up again by faith. You know, you can't hit a target unless you aim to it. Right? I like guns, and that's a simple truth. So let's faith, by faith believe for that. And, you know, I was talking to Pastor a little bit about tithing. Remember? You just spoke about it. And God gave me sort of a revelation putting tithing and blessing Israel in the same category. You know why? They're both a dare from God. In all fashioned way, a triple dog dare you, said the Lord. Okay? Because there's a blessing attached, right, to tithing. There's a blessing attached to blessing Israel. But no, you'll never find out unless you take him on his dare. Right? No complicated. And fortunately, in our situation with these bomb shelters, it's a very tangible blessing on Israel. It takes it to praying for the peace of Jerusalem is crucially important. Praying for the salvation, very important. But protecting them and actually remodeling a bomb shelter that will be there basically until Jesus comes back. And then you continue ministering to them over internet, Facebook, WhatsApp. So it's a gift that keeps giving. Um, I'm really hoping that everything will come together. Um, do you have the PowerPoint with the two slides? back there about the uh, the trip right now we're scheduled was the for the end of um, March and the nice thing is that people can also raise funds for that trip versus a regular tour to Israel because it's a mission trip and if you sign up I'll give you more information about it there's also a catch of raising the funds for the actual remodeling of the bomb shelter and I mentioned before when I was here, the cost for a remodel of a bomb shelter is $25,000. Sounds like a huge amount. But ultimately, protecting 60 to 80 Israeli lives and potentially saving them till the Lord comes back, I think it's a smart investment. For individuals, businesses, or the church as a whole. I'll give you an example. You're familiar with Annaville Baptist, right? The neighboring church. This last spring, they sent 40 people and did four bomb shelters. So, I'm not com I'm not comparing, but I am challenging. Um, and the window of opportunity again to do this is not big, but I believe the dividends will be incredible and eternal. And even, I even go as far as saying it's going to be a good insurance policy for what's coming here. There's going to be hard times ahead here as well. Um, now, I want to bring up quickly a current situation going on that um, I'm working on with my people in Israel remotely right now. If you saw the news, a lot of people in the south were murdered in their, sh in their shelters because they couldn't lock them from the inside. And the old bomb shelters that you guys worked on hold 60, like I said, to 80 people. They cannot be locked from the inside. So we came up with a certain device. Do you have those short videos about the locking device for the shelters? Um, 
Anyway, some aluminum post that goes on the, on the door. Here you go. Let's watch this for a second. Yeah. The volume. Do you have, you have the other one, the other short one? How do you like the energy of that guy? Okay, there's uh, there's another one, short one. There you go. Amen. That's good. I'm watching the clock. I've got to wind it down. So, um, but that's just a little example. Uh, right now I'm worried about a land invasion by the Hezbollah in the north. It's teetering right now, possibly an, another front opening. Hopefully we'll never have to use these. In case we do, it costs us per shelter to manufacture, install, labor, 150 bucks for the window and the door. If the Lord speaks to your heart to help with that, wonderful. If not, that's okay too. But I'm just putting it out there. But pray seriously about contributing and participating in this effort for next year with the bomb shelters. And just want to tell you that ever since the Lord brought me here, I feel like this is home. I feel the love here. And it's an honor for me to work with all y'all blessing Israel. Thank you for your prayers. struggle getting up there for some reason. I guess that chair sank down low. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Oni. Thank you for sharing with us today. Amen. Give, give a hand, if you will. I want to... I, I said some things earlier, or earlier today, when we first started our service, that how sometimes the Lord... Uh, um, does things and you're a bit uncomfortable and and uh, we've just heard you know a, a message here from our information concerning Israel and uh, maybe some of us who are a little uncomfortable and uh, and that's okay that's okay being a bit uncomfortable I don't ask you to be comfortable with everything I say I'm just asking you to, to give it an opportunity to work uh, that's how I, how I am I've always said we're gonna stand on the truth my, our father taught us to love Israel, but in, in our loving of Israel, he taught us that. I can remember him talking to me, and I remember God talking to me in the office when I had my office here. And, and, but it doesn't mean that because I love Israel, I don't love somebody else. And I, I think that sometimes there's, 
as pastors and leaders, we have failed to really bring those truths to the, to the people of God. It doesn't mean that, that we have to take Israel's side so now we hate Palestinians or we take Israel's side so we hate Germans. So No, that's not the way it is because there are, there are uh, uh, Germans who are Jewish. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know about Palestinians, but I do know I've met a lot of uh, Palestinians and Arab people and, um, and who are Christians. <clears throat> as, as a matter of fact, in my hometown, we used to think they were Jewish, but I think they were Palestinians who lived in my hometown of Palestine, Texas. You know, yeah, and uh, had had stores, and I would go in there to buy my shoes because they told me uh, that they wanted to make the first sale. We always thought, oh, if they want to make the first sale, they must be Jewish, but they weren't. I don't think they were at all. I think they were Palestinians, and so. We want to love everybody because that's who we are as Christians. But helping Israel doesn't mean that I'm an enemy to Palest Palestinians. It doesn't. And if you are an enemy to Palestinians, that means, uh, Houston, we got a problem here. Are you with me? So as you hear Brother Ronnie teaching uh, and talking about his situation, uh, I think we ought to help. I, mean, I think we ought to help. I think we ought to give our hearts and our lives. I think we ought to do that. And... <clears throat> I, uh, I was um, looking at him just as he was sharing, and I was wondering, I wonder if that's what King David looked like him. <laughs> yeah. I, they, they said that King David was ruddy, huh? and he was good looking. Wow. <laughs> Come on back. Yes, thank you, Sister Stephanie. And so what I would like to do is just... Uh, you would prepare to be a blessing to, to Brother Ron if you'd like. You always make your checks out to CCCF, and, and we are really good at, at, at not being like some people, you know, t taking a processing fee. We don't do that. So we want you to give, and I know that now it's, our time is, is pretty much uh, behind us. But um, uh, before we go it, it, any further, yeah, thank you. Uh, Brother Copeland, what we're going to do is give you an offering envelope if you want it, an opportunity to give. One of the things that, that in this fellowship we've done historically, we've been very sensitive about pulling on you. We've been very sensitive. And those of you who are new here, you may not have seen that, but we're very sensitive about always pulling on the people of God, always asking them to empty their pockets. We don't do that here. But we also don't want to stifle those who would like to give. So you can always be a blessing. Amen. I was, uh, I got my, my little iPhone here. Pastor Tim preaches from an iPhone a lot of times. Uh, yeah, an iPhone. I don't know how he does it. I see him bringing that up, I go, how does he read it? Well, he's young. That's why he reads it. But um, we, we have, is there anybody here of, of, uh, of Jewish origin or Israeli origin other than Brother Roni? Anybody? I know we've got somebody upstairs, uh, Dr. Murphy, and, and I, I'll, whenever I'm talking about make, I want to make the Jews jealous. And I really mean that. I really want to make the Jews jealous. I want them to see me and this congregation and others enjoying their blessings. These are their blessings. It's almost as though they had the house and I'm living in it. And they're outside in a tent. I want to make them jealous. But not because I want to uh, receive their ire. I want them to know what they're missing. And I believe that the way the Christian community has an opportunity, and we have also not only an opportunity, but a responsibility to be the people of God and not in your own way. You know, people have attitudes and statements like, well, I'm a Christian in my own way. No, you're not a Christian at all if it's in your own way. Because God always calls us to do things we don't want to do. If you live for the Lord any time, he's required something of you that you did not want to give. And if you say, well, I've given him everything, I would say, not. He takes us by the hand and leads us to places where our humanity fears to go. And 
So let's walk this thing out. Let's walk it out. We are, I believe, living in the last of the last days. And I don't do that because I've got a feeling. I do that because of, I see the signs of the time. I want to read something, a scripture. And this may say it. I know not may say it. This does say it better than I could say it. For I, uh, this is Romans 12, verse 3. And Romans 12, verse 3 is basically a culmination of chapters 9, 10, and 11. It brings it all to a fuller understanding. Paul is talking about about how God has so blessed us and he has given us, we are the body of Christ. And in turn, he wants us to use our personal body for his service, whatever he wants. And now I know there are people here, without a doubt, there's somebody here who has been using your body for yourself. And that's not a Christian way of living. When you come to Jesus, he owns your body. And you're supposed to now present it to him, like give it to him for whatever he wants. Wow. I could get, if we had a, we didn't have the kids here, I could talk about that in a way that you'd get it. But it would be, it would be done well. But I would talk to you about the marriage, how, what marriage is, and what marriage is supposed to be. Like, like for the, me as the man, and I've always asked God, God, make me understand stuff that I don't know. Because my heart is to please God always, even when I'm messing up. Now, if your wife sees you messing up, she may think you're not trying to please God or her. <laughs> Throw a kink in that thing. But I'm really trying to please God every day of my life. But I can't do it if I don't consider my wife can't do it man that's one of those caveats that you want to take it out of the the dictionary the encyclopedia but so you have to give your body to the Lord I want you before you leave here you're going to give your body to the Lord so Paul says in verse 3 for I say I speak he's saying I say through the grace the unmerited favor the eye-opening reality that uh, given to me to everyone who is among you, not some of you, not most of you, but everyone who's among you, not to think of himself, even herself, more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. That means you haven't had any wine, no beer, no whiskey. To think soberly. You're in your right mind here. As God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So God has given each saved person a measure. Now you may have a thimble, but use your thimble. I'm asking for a, a barrels, lakes and ponds. I'm asking for that. He says he has dealt to every to each one a measure of faith. Then he says, so everybody has faith to do something that God said. Everyone. So you have to use it, all right? Let me get there. For as we have many members in one body, you know, fingers, hands, arms, legs, feet, you know, all these body parts. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. We don't all function together. You know, we, get, we, we love the mouth, don't we? But without the eyes, the mouth is limited. Without the ears, the mouth is limited. Without feet, the mouth can't get to where it needs to get. And so he says, they don't all have the same function. I, I'm saying this because I want us to understand the functionality that we have just experienced here with Brother Roney. And now as pastor, I'm just kind of speaking that I'm speaking really not contra to what he says but I'm saying okay this is how we look at that this is how we look at everything all members do not have the same function so we being many are one body that is all of us around here let's look around and we're all one body we're all looking the same outside we're still one body 
And you don't have to look like me for me to love you. You don't have to be a Texan either or an American for me to love you. I love my people from all over the world. Amen. I'm not going to break your hearts like my mama broke mine. And she came and looked me in my face, squarely in my face, told me uh, the unvarnished truth, M messed me up for a while. Even though I was about 42 or 47, one of those telling me she loved all of her children the same. How could she? How could she? Listen to what he says. I'm almost done with it. So we being many are one body in Christ. Now listen to this. This is a blow your waist thing. And individually, members of one another, so I, in my 76th year of life, I'm understanding something I, I didn't understand so fully. And this is what I'm understanding. I'm going to use this, these Texas vernacular for a moment. I can't be mad at you because you hurt my feelings. I can't stay it that way. Why? Can you imagine me? I can't stand you. What? I need you. Your sorry foot. Whoa, no. I know I tripped, but thank you. I still need you. Now, now, now pick yourself up next time. Well, strengthen your, your legs, your calves, and your thighs. Oh, I need them too. Are y'all getting me? So we're, we're, we're many, but man, we, we, we're members one another. I, I have to love you. When I say I have to love you, I don't mean there's a gun in my head. Because we're, we're not just individualistic. Listen to what he said. Having then gifts differing. These, these gifts we have differing according to the grace that is given to us according to the grace so what he says that our gifts every one of us we're not the same but our gifts come from grace the grace of god according to the grace that's given. so my gifts are grace gifts therefore god wanted me to have are you still with me i know it's a little late oh lord it's more late than i thought all right let me let me wrap this up quickly let us use then. Let us use. Pastor Tim, you're going to have to help me one day. Okay, all right, I got it again. Okay. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, encouraging people, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So God is saying, let's use our gifts right, all right? So today I want us to use our giving gifts here, and then I want us to use our responding gifts in that we're going to do what is right in the eyes of God before God, all right?